Ruth chapter number 1, we'll begin reading in verse number 14. And they lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clave unto her. And she said, Behold, thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people, and unto her gods, return thou after thy sister-in-law. And Ruth said, Entreat me not to leave thee, or to return from following after thee, for whither thou goest I will go, and where thou lodgest I will lodge. Thy people should be my people, and thy God my God. Wherefore thou diest, I, or where thou diest I will die, and there will I be buried. The Lord do to me so, and more also, if aught but death, part thee and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, then she left, speaking unto her. Now, we didn't have time to read the first 13 verses, but you'll find that in the beginning of the chapter, famine hits Israel. And so Naomi's husband, Elimelech, and his two sons, left Israel to go and sojourn in the land of Moab. We don't have time to get into Moab and what that represents but what it all boils down to is Elimelech and his two sons didn't have enough faith that God could provide for them in the midst of a famine so they thought that well instead of believing in God we'll go to a place that looks more plentiful right? and we have a whole lot of examples throughout the Bible of those that forsook faith and instead embraced what their senses told them what logic told them Lot be another example According to the book of Genesis, you go and read the story a lot. The book of Genesis calls the plains where those cities were, so that it looked as if it were the garden of God. It looked as plentiful and bountiful as the garden of Eden. It made sense to the carnal man, just as it made sense to Elimelech and Malon and Chilion, his two sons to leave Israel and to go to Moab because there was food there right? they could stay alive over there they could make a living in the meantime well in the meantime all three of them died so you have Naomi Elimelech's wife the mother-in-law in the verses that we just read you've got Orpah and then you've got Ruth and you find in verse number 14 they're in the midst of grieving that's why they lift up their voice and wept again. But you find that Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, meaning that she was bidding her goodbye, as if she was to say, I'm never going to see you again. But it says that Ruth clave unto Naomi. Then you find verses that we read, verse 16, Ruth gives her spiel as to why she's not going back. Naomi told her, Thy sister-in-law has gone back unto her people. Okay, then, she says, And has gone back unto her gods. Return thou after thy sister-in-law. Now notice, she didn't say, Has returned to your people. Talking about both of them. She said, Orpah went back to her people. Orpah went back to her gods. She didn't say went back to the gods of Orpah and Naomi, both of them. Didn't say went to your gods. Which tells me that when Ruth married into the family, she bought all in. She said, my gods are no longer the gods of Moab. My gods, the living God, Jehovah. You'll find that she forsook all. Oh. Now keep in mind, this is back during the time of the patriarchs. Okay, marriage was a little bit different than it is nowadays. Okay, even, you know, you can go back to the 1700s, and they were still doing what were called dowries. Right, even in the, the Western world, some places they still do it to this day. About two fathers would come together and say, hey, my son needs to get married, you've got a daughter. So, the father of the bride would say, well, okay, how much are you going to give me for? Right? Not saying it was right, but women were treated almost as property. Right? Well, if your son wants children, he's going to need a woman. I've got a daughter. 
how badly does your son really want to get married? And they would negotiate a price, and then once the dowry was paid, then the marriage could happen. And see, the father of the bride, mother of the bride, when they got married, they didn't expect to see him all that often. There wasn't vacations, there wasn't holiday weekends. She was a part of the other family now. Right? They paid the price. They wanted her so badly that now she's associated with them. Right? Ruth knew that. I believe Ruth didn't have any qualms about that. But when Ruth married into the family, she said, that's my old life. This is my new life. Right? Orpah still held on to the old things. Orpah said, well, I'm a part of this family, but my heart's still back in Moab. And you understand, both of their husbands died. All three of their husbands died. They were grieving, but also they were crying out because they knew that they had very little hope of making it. Women weren't allowed to work a nine-to-five back in the day. Right? Women's role, their job, was to be the keeper of the home. They didn't go out and shuck corn. They didn't go out and plant. And every time that you find somebody in the Bible that was a woman who has to do manual labor in order to make a living, that woman's had a hard life. You can look at the Shunammite maid in the Song of Solomon. She called herself black, meaning scorched by the sun. Right? She wasn't fair and fair of skin. Right? She wasn't one of those porcelain skin people that they used to make paintings of. Right? She had signs that she had to work. She didn't have anybody to take care of her vineyard for. Her. So she had to take care of, you know, it, she says she took care of everybody's vineyards in the family. Right? And she neglected her own because she was so busy about their business. But what are we saying? They knew it was going to be a rough life for them. Orpah knew that if she went back to her people, she might be able to get another husband. Nowhere do you find that Ruth questions, well, where's my next husband? Look at what Ruth says. She says, Entreat me not to leave thee or to return from following after thee. Now that word entreat, that means don't give me, she says, entreat not. Right? Naomi's doing what she thought would have been best for Ruth. She says, this is your people. Go back to them. Ruth says, they're not my people no more. I'm one of your people now. She said, the price was paid, and now I'm associated with y'all. I'm no longer Ruth the Moabitess. I'm now Ruth, the one that married Naomi's son. She says, entreat me not. That word entreat means to, you know, d direct. Or in other words, to send on someone's way. Right? If you entreat for somebody, you're trying to give them good advice so that they go out and you offer a little bit of counsel, a little bit of wisdom maybe, and you say, go on and be about your own business. Right? If you take up somebody's burden, you're not entreating with them, you're yoking up with them. Entreating means that I don't want to be a part of it, but I'll give you a little bit of advice. She says, don't send me away with advice. Let me follow after you. She said, I understand that you're a little bit wiser than I am, Naomi, but don't send me back to that place. It's bad right now. They just lifted up their voices together and wailed. They're grieving. They're heartbroken. They have no idea what tomorrow's going to look like. But yet she still says, I know that your people and your God, the only shot I got. But she doesn't just say, your God. We'll get to that here in a second. But she says, for whither thou goest, I'm going to go. She said, I'm not going to leave you. Obviously, Naomi, older than Ruth. We don't know by about how much. But she's her mother-in-law. And you can glean from the rest of the story in the book of Ruth that 
Naomi, who changed her name to Mara, when she got back to Israel, got back down into Bethlehem, right? she says, and directs Naomi to go and glean from the fields, right? to try and find someone that would show kindness to her and allow her to take some of the sheaves that fall by the wayside. And that maybe Ruth and Naomi or Mara would be able to eat and eke out a living. Not starve to death. Right? They weren't looking to turn a profit. They were just looking to make it by. But it's implied that Naomi couldn't go and stay in the fields all day long. She was at an age that her prime was behind her. She knew that there was a good shot. Nobody wanted to marry Naomi. She knew that nobody would look at Naomi and show her kindness, even though she was one of their people. She knew that if there was any shot for her, Ruth would have had to help her. If Naomi would have gone back on her own, she might have been able to move in with somebody for a while. She might have been able to find some friends that would be kind to her, but nobody was going to take Naomi in. She knew that. She changed her name to Mara. That meant bitter. She said because God dealt bitterly with her, but it's because her family walked out on God, and God said, well, I'll let you go. She said, I'm reaping bitterness because that's what we sowed. She knew she didn't have a shot. But Naomi said, I'm following after you. I'm going to take care of you. Even though you don't know how we're going to take care of ourselves, I'm going to make sure, because you're part of my family, that you're taken care of. She said, I don't have a mom back in Moab anymore. You're my mom. Then she says, Thy people shall be my people in other words she said I'm already in the family just go introduce me to everybody else she says when I married in now I'm a part of you let's go back to where we belong is what she's saying then she says and thy God my God she doesn't say that I have faith in your God she says no our God is back in Israel so let's go to where he is Whatever Ruth saw, she knew enough to know that the God of Israel was able to take care of her a whole lot better than anything in Moab. That's why Orpah returned to her gods, but Ruth didn't have the gods of Moab anymore. She already purposed in her heart that she's going back to where God was. She found the truth and she clung to it. Right now, we can draw a metaphor between this point right here in Ruth's life to the life of somebody who gets saved. Right? Ruth learned about Jehovah and she said, everything that was before, it's dead. It's gone. Right? That new man, that new creature that he promised to make us into, Ruth said, that's not me anymore. Right? I've received, so to speak, adoption into the family of God. She said, I may not look the part, people may not think that I belong, but I'm one of you now. She said, that privilege was given to her because she married into the family. But well, we got born into the family, we got adopted into the family, and one of these days we're going to get married into the family. That's how much God wanted us to be a part of His family. But you understand, back in this day, when an Israelite married somebody, even if they went against the law because the law had been given by this point and the law was not to take strange wives but if you married in use in they couldn't disown you technically Naomi owned all the land that Elimelech used to own it belonged to her now Ruth owned the property that her husband used to own but how are they going to afford to pay people to work it? Right? How are they going to buy oxen to go out and till up the land? 
they had a plot of land, but they couldn't do anything with it. So they were going back to a place where it was home, but they had no way of providing for themselves. Right? Just like us. Right? We're on our way home, but I don't know what I need between now and then. I've got a mansion over the you know, over the hill on the other side. Once we cross the other But until I get there, Lord, I'm relying on you. Even once we get there, it's all because of him. Right? Ruth's saying, I've got a claim, but even with that claim, I can't use to the full extent everything that you know the privileges that I have unless somebody comes along and shows you know favor to me kindness eventually she finds that in a man named Boaz right? and Boaz called a business meeting and said hey one of y'all is closer related to Elimelech than I was I want to redeem that property right? and then he also says redeem Ruth take her to my wife he says, and I'm going to pay Naomi the fair share for her property in it all. He says, you want it? The guy said, no. Boaz took off his shoe, gave it to him and said, all right, I'm going to buy it. Right, that's where we get the doctrine of the kinsman redeemer. If Ruth and if Rahab wouldn't have been a part of the lineage of God, there'd been no hope for the Gentiles. It's one of the great blessings in the story of Ruth for us nowadays. Right? But a kinsman redeemed her and said, not only is she a part of that family, right? she's going to get married. Into, in other words, without a doubt, she's going to be in. Then you find out she had a son named Jesse and then he had a son named David. Right? King David. But all that being said, I'm talking about Ruth being a picture of the new creature, new life. Right, you want evidence of that? If you would go to chapter number 2, verse number 11. This is what Boaz says to Ruth when she asked him, Why have you been kind to me? Why have you shown me such favor? And this is what Boaz said. Boaz answered and said unto her, It hath been fully showed me all that thou hast done unto thy mother-in-law since the death of thine husband, and how thou hast left thy father and thy mother in the land of thy nativity, and art come up to a people which thou knewest not heretofore, the Lord recompense thy work, and a full reward be given thee of the Lord God of Israel, under whose wings thou art come to trust. He said, I'm showing favor to you because you just put all your faith in God, and that deserves to be rewarded. He said, God's blessed me so good, I can spare it. But he also says, everything had been told him what he had done to her mother-in-law she wasn't just coming to try and elevate herself she was saying my first priority is my mother-in-law right? my responsibilities Ruth didn't shuck the fact that when she got in she had some responsibilities right? just like us we get born into the family of God God gives us some expectations some responsibilities that we're supposed to do and he said, you do your best to do that, not under your own strength, not through cunning, not through looks, right? not through your ability to persuade somebody to do it. He said, you forsook all, and you just had faith. Not in a man, not in a people, not even in your own mother-in-law. He said, you put faith in God and that she had put so much faith, she was just cuddled up so close to God that she was underneath of his wings. Wasn't standing afar off, she's as close as she could get. Just saying, Lord, I'm relying on you. And God led her to Boaz. Right? Well, for lack of a better term, Ruth was all in. Wasn't no doubt in her mind. Never turned around and looked back. Never second guess, well, Naomi, it's gotten kind of hard on this trek over here. I'm headed back to Moab. No, she purposed in her heart long before they ever left that they was going and she wasn't coming back. 
Not because of the life that she may have, but because she knew that's where God was. She sold out. She just said, Naomi, I don't know what I can do, but whatever I can, I'll do my best to take care of you. Because I love you. Ruth went all the way in. Right in verse number 17, she said, Where thou diest, will I die, and there will I be buried. And she made a vow unto Naomi and said, That if I don't do it, God kill me and do worse to me if I break that vow unto you. She said, My only hope is going back to where God is, and if I turn my back on Him, God kill me because I deserve it. She's saying, I've seen the light. I'm so serious that if I turn my back, God not only had the right to, but she said, I deserve to be killed. Because I forsook God. Not, not a lot of Christians say that nowadays. Not a lot of Christians give more than Sunday morning to them, let alone the rest of their life. Right? Well, Ruth, I see is a picture of consecration. Now, Wednesday night we heard about sanctification, how we cannot sanctify ourselves. Right? Consecration does not mean that we are holy. Right? Even if we are sanctified, we are not yet holy in this sin cursed flesh. Right? But we are sanctified and robed in His righteousness. He imparts or gives on purpose His holiness to us so that we can be favorable and pleasing unto the Father. Well, consecration comes before sanctification. Consecration, a big fancy word that just means reserved for the sole use of. Or in other words, you've just given your all unto God. You say, Lord, I'm not much, but whatever I am, you can have it. They used to consecrate priests or kings or vessels that were to be used in the house of God. It was a public outshowing that this is solely reserved for whatever God wants to use it for. If God doesn't want to use it, God wants to use every bit of it. We're going to keep it clean. We're going to keep it ready and in a state where it can be used. And when it's time to be used, we're going to use it the best that we know how to give glory and honor unto God. So when we consecrate ourselves, we're saying, Lord... Make me into what you want me to be. Use me however you want to. Just lead God and direct me, and I'll do my best to follow you. Notice Ruth didn't tell Naomi, hey, follow me, we're going back home. She said, show me the way, and I'll do my best to follow you. She didn't promise that she'd be able to keep pace with her. She didn't promise that she wouldn't stumble. She just said, I'm following you, and we're going back home. Right? Well, nowadays there's no consecration because first, there's not commitment. In order to be consecrated, you got to be committed. Ruth was so committed that over in chapter number 2 when Boaz started talking to her, he said, you forsook it all. You forsook your family, forsook your friends, forsook everything that you were ever taught because of your faith in God. Right? Now, don't get me wrong. There's a lot of things that you can learn out there that will be a benefit to you. Right? If you, you want to be like Brother Phil, learn how to weld. Right? You can be a welder, but you've got to know how to weld before you can be a welder. Right? Same thing goes for any trade. Same thing goes for any job. There are always things that you can learn. But how many of us try and take things that have carnal origins and then Apply them to the things of God. That's not consecrated. I read a quote this morning. It said, Give a hard job to somebody lazy and you'll find the quickest way to get it done. It didn't say the best way to get it done, but it said the quickest way. Right? They're going to take shortcuts. It might be shoddy, but they're going to get it done as quick as they can get it done because they want to go back to doing nothing. But how many people of God try to use worldly logic, worldly motives to shortcut the things of God to get it done as quick as they can so that they can go back to doing what they want to do? No commitment. 
Commitment means that you're in regardless of the pain, regardless of the struggle. And I mean, the Bible's not hiding the fact that Jesus said, take up thy cross and follow me. I've got my own burden to carry. It's going to get heavy. There are going to be burdens that I feel like are going to break me, but through faith I know that He won't let anything break me. He didn't save me to make a mockery out of me. He saved me to make me into the image of His Son. Right? The Bible tells us how committed God was to us, and all He expects is the same commitment. He doesn't ask our firstborn sons. Right? He doesn't ask that we shed our blood. What's He asked? That we're just fully committed to Him like He was to us. Well, in order to be consecrated, in order to be set aside for the use of God, right? not just when you come in, set, your side, set yourself aside and say, Lord, I'm here to worship today. If you want to use me, go ahead and use me. Not talking about that. Not talking about service. I'm talking about every day, day in and day out. Lord, use me as a beacon on the job. Shine a light for you. Lord, use me as somebody to edify or to encourage the brethren. Lord, use me to help bring the church closer together that we might be in one accord rather than causing divisions and strife among the people of God. Lord, fill me with your love and not the love of the world. Lord, fill me with your desires instead of my desires. Consecrated is not a part-time thing. It's an all-the-time thing. And in order to stay consecrated, you've got to be committed. You know what commitment really is? You love what you're doing more than anything else. The Bible says where your heart is, that's where your treasure will be. Whatever you love most, that's what you're committed to most. Whatever you desire most is what you're going to spend the most time seeking out. Whatever you favor most is what you're going to give most of your time to. Whatever you enjoy the most is where you're going to be spending all of your time at. Consecrated just means, Lord, I enjoy you so much. I just want to be used by you all the time. Consecrated is selfless. If you're committed, you don't care what you get out of it. You care what other people get out of it. Consecrated means, Lord, fill me up so that you can pour me out to other people. I know you're going to take care of me. I'm not worried about holding on to these blessings, holding on to these things that you've given me to be used for your honor and your glory. Use me up. Fill me back up and then use me again. Because every time I get filled, I'm satisfied. Every time He pours me out, I'm satisfied. I'm so committed that I stop thinking about my wants, my desires, and I start looking at other people. Like I said, never once do we find that Naomi, I mean that Ruth took concern for herself. She was worried about Naomi. She said, I'm going with you and I'm going to make sure to the best of my ability that you're taken care of. She said, by the grace of God, He's going to pour out such a blessing on us. He's not just going to take care of me. He's going to take care of both of us. And you find that He did that. Pressed down, shaking and bubbling over. You go and study it out. Ruth didn't just glean... That meant she grabbed the stuff that fell out of the cart. Boaz told him, hey, drop some handfuls on purpose. If she wanders off into a field that's got the good stuff in it, don't stop her. And even if she comes up and takes something out of the cart, let her have it. He says, don't let any of the workers yell at her. He told her, if you want a drink, get a drink that the young men drew out of the water. You don't have to go draw it. Get a drink whenever you need it. But with us, He promised to take care of all of our needs. Right? If in the midst of me getting filled and poured out or being used to bring honor and glory unto God, if I get thirsty, He's got the water right there. I don't have to go draw it. Right? I've got a well bubbling up inside of me, springing forth with that new water, that everlasting life. Always there to satisfy. And let's be honest, best place you can be Right, Boaz, 
picture of God's blessings. Best place that you can be is at God's house. She knew if she'd have gone to anywhere else, I mean, she fell down at his feet, praising him, thanking him, saying, Hey, why are you being so kind to me? Boaz knew nobody else was going to be as kind to her. But he did it because he wanted to be a blessing. He said, I see how much faith you have in God. He says, I don't see that in God's own people. Her own husband walked out on God and went to a foreign land and it cost him his life. She learned, just give everything to God. She was committed. She said, no turning back. Right, there's the old analogy. I think it was Cortez when he brought Spanish conquistadors over here to the New World. When they landed, he burned all the ships. He said, we're here now. There's no going back home. He says, there's no way out. Can't chicken your way out. He says, we're here until the job gets done. All right, but too many of us still got a boat docked at the pier. We turn around, we look at, well, I can still go back to something else. I can still go back to where I came from. Ruth just said, burn the bridge. Burn the boat. We've got one way to go, and that's this way. She was committed. Right, but second, nowadays, reason when there's no consecration, it's because there's no conviction. I'm not talking about oh, what technically we are. But I'm not talking about God revealing in us sin, that kind of conviction. God's the same yesterday, today, and forever. Those that come to the Lord seeking to know what He's not pleased with in their life, He'll reveal to them what He's not pleased with in their life. I'm talking about conviction is in gumption. Right? People don't have backbones anymore. People have gotten to the point that when it gets hard, they look for the easy way. Ruth knew it wasn't going to be easy. Right? She was out there in the fields, in the hot sun, following behind stinky animals and sweaty dudes, just looking and hoping that they would drop something by the wayside and it'd get dirty. That's why they wouldn't put it back in the cart. They thought, well, that's no good no more. They may have been trampled under the feet of whoever was pulling the cart. Right? Something, and you know, it may have fell in a cow pie. They're like, well, that's not no good anymore. That's what Ruth was looking for. That was worth more than gold to her. Because it's barley. They could make something out of that to eat. And then after spending all day in the field, you go and study it out, she had to go and she had to sift the barley. In other words, she had to get rid of all the stuff that they couldn't eat until she was left with the stuff that they could eat. It was a hard-working, laborious job. But after the first day, she didn't say, well, see, this isn't what I signed up for, Naomi. This is, this is more than I bargained for. She went back the next day, and the next day, and the next day. Conviction, if you truly are, that word just means convinced. If you're really convinced that God's the best way for your life, nothing can deter you. But see, just because you have conviction today doesn't mean that it's guaranteed tomorrow. It's one of them things that you have to renew every day. Why do you think the Apostle Paul wrote that, you know, he to stir up our pure minds within us, that we faint not in our minds, that we not grow weary in well-doing, Right? All that encouragement that we find in the New Testament is because conviction isn't just a medal that you can put on every day and say, well, okay, I've got some convictions today. Ruth believed him so much she disowned her own mother and father. Jesus said, if you love father and mother more than me or son and daughter more than me, you're not worthy of them. She was just convinced that God was the best way, that he deserved it all. But see, if you've got conviction, you've also got some things that set you apart from everybody else. Boaz had seen a lot of people come and glean in the fields before. But you find that Boaz came home from a business trip one day, and he looked out in the field and he asked the guy, in you know, his head, either employee or servant or whoever it was, he looked at him and said, who's that? And he said, oh, that's Ruth, the Moabitess. Came back with Naomi. He said, there's something different about her. 
She had conviction. She was so convinced that she left everything just on the whim that God would show mercy to her. We've got a whole book explaining to us that after we get in, the choice blessings of God are ours to claim. All we got to do is get in a position to receive them. All these promises were given to us so that we would be convinced of the fact that God would do it if we were just smart enough to do what He asked us to do. I mean, doesn't have the, you know, the threshold for understanding that very low. But how come so many people get things mixed up? Because they're convinced that there's things that they need that really they don't need. Right, like in Washington D.C., they call it earmarking a bill. That's when they say, "Okay, we're going to pass a law to fix the bridge in downtown Cincinnati." Okay, well, um, we're going to add welfare to it we're going to add this to it that to it this to it and then they end up pork barreling it and they just say well hey that coronavirus relief bill would be great but you guys understand how many pages were attached to the back of that people trying to get stuff passed well but hey they're going to pass it because they want to look good in front of everybody else so if they're just going to pass it let's throw all this unrelated stuff onto the back of it all right let's just add all this stuff in and hopefully it'll sweep, you know, underneath of the radar. Nobody will pick up on what we did. Well, Christians do the same thing. But Lord, here's what, how I'm going to live. But I'm going to add this to it. I'm going to squeeze this in whenever I can. If I've got time, I'm going to go over here and do this. And then eventually those add-ons, we become convinced that we need them when we don't need them. Our conviction turns from solely devoted to God to, well, Lord, I'm caught between two opinions. I could do something for God. I could do this, or I could continue in the way that I see. Nobody says restore. Nobody says return to the old paths. They're looking for the new way, whatever they can do to you know, get that edge on everything. There's no edge. The way's called straight. Laid out, it's plain. It's real easy to comprehend. But how do you do it? Jesus, He's the way, the truth, and the life. He lived, I'm in Him, He's in me. I'm the tabernacle of the Holy Ghost. He indwells me because He knew I couldn't do it on my own. But yet, we're not convinced that that's enough. But we need this person's opinion or this author's latest book or family member's opinion well if grandma don't okay it then I'm not going to do it well what if grandma doesn't know the difference between being right with God and talking to her dog you say well that's silly some people live like that they're not convinced that God's word is the absolute and final authority and if he said it that's enough they say they do, but when the rubber meets the road, they're not out in the field gleaning. They're over there expecting a handout. They're asking God, well, God, why didn't you bless me today? Well, maybe because you didn't get to where the blessings were. Ruth found some blessings, and she just kept going back. She's convinced that that's the best place that she could be because God led her to that place. But then finally... There's no conviction because some people just walk away from Christ. I mean, there's no consecration because people just walk away from Christ. Ruth never would have gotten married, never would have been redeemed, never would have had a permanent way to not only take care of her, but also her mother-in-law, if she had stopped going to Boaz's farm. She had stopped showing up. No more barley. If she'd stopped showing up, Boaz would have said, you know what? I was wrong about her. I thought she had faith. But she wasn't convicted enough to keep her faith. Boaz tells her at one point, he says, there's somebody nearer to me, or nearer than me to you guys, that has the legal right to redeem you before I can. He says, I'm not promising anything, but I'll go out and I'll try. And that was enough for Ruth. 
she didn't say well if you can't do it then forget about it they didn't say I'll find somebody else's farm to go and hang out at I'll go and I'll hang out with somebody somewhere that promises that they're going to give me all the blessings that I think I deserve you know what the problem is now? everybody's looking to be a minority in some way shape or form but everybody's trying to find a way that they think they've been robbed and then they want somebody else to give them what they think that they're owed right well you're white but if you're a woman that makes you a minority even though they make up more than 50 percent of the population i haven't figured that one out yet i thought minority was the smaller group of people right? but if you're a woman there's a whole bunch of people marching saying that there's things that they deserve right if you're something other than white but a white man stole from you right? if you don't have money take it from the people that do have money just make them give it to you right no you don't have a nice place to live go take it from somebody else right? that's the mindset of today right there's no stick to itiveness people follow whoever says they can give them the most stuff for the least amount of work Ruth never asked to be married into the family again she never asked for the handfuls on purpose that Boaz dropped she never asked for anything but she just said I'm going to follow God everything else was you know the icing on top of the cake and then the ice cream that came with it and then the third and fourth course of dessert that followed after that she said all I was looking for was to make it by and God's been too good for me to throw in the towel now Boaz she says I don't deserve any I deserve to be dead back in Moab but instead of that God's shown me mercy whatever God wants that's what I'm in favor of she says if it's you that redeems me that'd be fantastic she says but if not God's got a plan never once do you find her doubting questioning turning her back on the things that God she just said there's one way that's worked she had a whole life before everything she tried it didn't work all them gods in Moab she knew they didn't work her mother and father as much as they may have loved her, her their way didn't work she said there's only one way that works and I'm sticking with it but yet so many of us think well this is the life that I want from God how dare we we've been bought with a price more importantly than that his ways are above our ways right? I mean Jesus himself said they hated him they'd hate us those that live godly shall suffer persecution that's not God's fault that's sinful and wicked man's fault but he promised that he'd never leave us nor forsake us that's good enough for me why? because I'm more than a conqueror through Christ a conqueror just comes in and lays waste to something right? conqueror just comes in destroys it and says I own this now we're more than conquerors that means Christ handles it and we get to move into the city instead of it being destroyed right like Psalm 23 he just prepares a table in the midst of the enemy puts out the feast for us right we're better than somebody that comes in and raises it all in order to get it how many times did God work in a way that dumbfounded man and instead of having to lay waste to something God's people get to reap the rewards of it most of the time without even lifting a finger did they deserve it? no Israel's guilty all the time doubting right? disobedience but yet God gave to those that were obedient to follow after him Ruth just said I've hitched my cart to the right horse his name's Jehovah people aren't consecrated you can't give yourself over to something that you're willing to walk out on in an instant and I don't judge those that in my man looks on the outward appearance God looks on the heart 
But I don't judge those that go through something and then they find themselves away from the things. I haven't walked in their shoes. Right? We all say, well, no, I'd never do that. Well, you may get hit with something less than that and do worse. Right? There are decisions that people have to make that, by the grace of God, I haven't had to make. There's things that people have been through that, by the grace of God, I haven't faced. But, by His grace, and with His help, if I do face it, hopefully, right, committed, right, with conviction, I won't turn on Christ. Peter saw Him every day for three and a half years and denied Him three times in one night. Why? Because of fear. You know what fear does? Kills faith. You know what Ruth had a lot of? Faith. You know what the indictment on the people? When the sun returns, shall you find faith on the earth? Didn't say religion. Didn't say routine. It's talking about that faith that propels you towards a mountain. Jesus said with faith the size of a grain of mustard seed, we could say, be cast off into the ocean. The greater faith than that is, Lord, you want me to go towards that mountain? If you move it, fantastic. If you don't, I'm climbing the mountain. If you pointed me in that direction, I'm climbing it no matter how steep it is, no matter how many you know cuts and scrapes along the way I may get. Whatever it is, you put it in my way, we're going to face it together. Faith is not the tool that we can say, well, it's just an easy life. No, faith's what propels you through the hardness because you know that there's something better. That even your worst day with Christ is a whole lot better than your best day without Him. Consecration is just saying, Lord, no matter what comes, I'm here, I'm ready to be used of you. I can't do much, but I can, when you show me them dingy spots, I can polish them up. Right, I can't do much, Lord, but if you tell me to be a cup, I can be a cup. You tell me to be a water barrel, I can be a water barrel. Whatever you equip me to do, that's what I'll do my best to do. Because God doesn't call the equipped, God equips the called. He doesn't look for people with ability, He looks for people with availability. Those that just say, Lord, there's a whole lot of reasons why it shouldn't work out, but with you, all things are possible. With you, you could take a little bit of dirt turned into something that can be used to bring honor and glory into you. It's not always easy, but it is worth it. Because when we stand before Him one day, we'll, those that are consecrated will hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. The others will be shown all the times that they could have been consecrated. And they'll have to stand before the one that died for them and take account and responsibility for the fact, Lord, I didn't live the way that you wanted me to. Blood will be required at their hands. Those that they could have reached, but didn't. It's just better to get consecrated, but then also to stay consecrated. Thanks to listeners like you, IBC has had over 100,000 views on our YouTube channel. If you haven't already, subscribe today. And as always... Thanks for listening.